This is gonna hurt. It's time, it's time for, the for the Suffering Podcast. podcast. We all have that one thing about our personality or physical appearance that highlights our self-consciousness, hiding it from the world and attempting to present ourselves as what we would like to see, holding that deep, dark secret close to the chest to protect it from prying eyes. Inevitably, that one thing we see as a character flaw will reveal itself at the worst possible moment, leaving us vulnerable at a young age to endure the teasing and taunting, never having any ability to unring that bell. The world can be a cruel place for a self-conscious person, unable to hide or mask what they see as their deficiency, always feeling like there's two strikes against us from the moment we are born. I'm Kevin Donaldson here with Mike Felace, and welcome to The Suffering Podcast. If you're a fan of overcoming adversity and overcoming suffering, then we're for you because that's what we do here and that's the stories that we highlight. So do me a favor, hit that like button, subscribe to the channel, please comment, ring the bell to get notified of all of our new content. Now you can join. Follow us on all social media so you can find out what we're up to. On this episode of The Suffering Podcast, we welcome in a friend of a friend, and that's Ken Teets, to talk about the suffering of a stutterer. Isn't that how we get all of our guests now? Of course. A friend of a friend. A friend of a friend. This person knows this person. He's got a great story. Ken, you're not from Hoboken, are you? No, (laughs) That's not not a Hoboken connection? So uh, No, this isn't a Hoboken (laughs) connection. So it's funny because obviously we're in here to talk about the the suffering of a stutter, and I don't even want you to talk yet. I want you to surprise everybody. (laughs) No, I'm only kidding you. Thanks. I'm only kidding you. Um, But, you know, somebody sees that as, as an adult, you see that as a very innocuous, very non- it's not even an issue anymore. But when you're a kid, I'm sure it was very different. Before we get into anything, I want to throw a big shout out to our marquee sponsor. That's Toyota of Hackensack. We don't trust anybody as police, but we do trust them. So go to toyotahackensack.com and let them find you a car. So, Ken, each week we take a question from our audience. And this question comes from Roberto underscore Finn. And it's going to be, I'm going to ask it to you a little bit different as a viewer. And, and we're going to answer a little different as the people who do it. Uh, it somebody wrote in. Why do you crack jokes during shows? Um, you, you're a Clark Fredericks connection, and probably one of the most inappropriate jokes was cla- was cracked during that that episode. You gotta you gotta go there already. I mean, come on, <laughs> the guy he doesn't even have a chance to hate me yet. <laughs> but I under see I understand why Mike cracked that joke. I do. So as a viewer, do you ever see any of the times? that we crack jokes or is it ever inappropriate or we land them right? What land do you think? Land them wrong. Land them wrong. No. Um, I think you have to have a sense of humor and you have to, cause it's such a serious situation. It's such a serious um, topic and you have to have a sense of humor, especially for the person who went through it. Cause if you don't, then you're going to be so uptight and, you know, listening to it, especially the Clark one, you were like on the edge of your seat and so tense and, you know, you crack a joke and you're like, okay, you know. It clears the air. It clears the air. Yes. Absolutely. It gets so palpable in here yeah. and we felt it. Yes. Especially like so you take an episode like Clark's. And by the time second, the second time Clark came in, we knew him. You know, we, be, we developed a friendship with him. So the jokes were a little bit freer. Easier. Easier. Yes. In the beginning, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go off to Mr. Sensitive over here. <laughs> uh, they were, it, it was a nervous thing. It, it really was. Like you said, we didn't know Clark. The second time he came in, we were friends at that point. Mm-hmm. First Especially time, made... he's a big guy. Oh yeah, yeah no kidding. <laughs> and I'm stuck in a corner. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, if Clark got up and started throwing stuff, I'm feeding the mic. But I go under the table because I don't think Clark would fit under the table. <laughs> I know why you crack jokes, and I know why I, I crack jokes during the, the the show. So why don't you give our audience a little taste of why you do it? Well, you know, I, I tell everybody, and I can I told you before, Kevin, you're the real interviewer here. You know, Thank you. I'm. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> At least you got one compliment this month. You did say something nice about my ass, so. Yeah, well, well that's when I was grabbing it. But anyway, <laughs> like you said, things get very palpable in here. They get very tense. You know, we, we talk about some deep, dark stuff. And as we all know, careers in law enforcement, 
shit gets real nasty at times. And the only way you can get through it is to joke about it. Absolutely. If you're going to eat that stuff and take it home, you're, I mean, it's, it's not going to be a good scene when you get home. So, I, you know, and we always talk about the, the dark humor in law enforcement. You, you, know, know, you go to a nasty scene. And you're sitting down in the car laughing and joking. And, and if pe- and you said it before, too. If people ever saw that, they say, these, these cops have no heart. You know? Yeah. But that's the way we deal with it. We deal with it. Yeah, exactly. You, you know, we're human. You yeah. know, when things affect us and it, we don't know what to do. It, it carries over into, into this show. And Bobby Crudell put it the best. His laughter is the best medicine. You know, if, if you're having a bad day and a friend comes, even if you got tears in your eyes and he's able to get a chuckle out of you, he did something wonderful for you. You know, we, when we're seeing something or hearing something that's just so awful, and especially when we don't know the person really well that's sitting across from us, you're going to hear a very nervous attempt to lighten the mood a little bit in order to lift stuff up. We have to. It, it may not be appropriate all the time and there's nothing that we can do about it it is our attempt to clear our heads to empty our glass sometimes the jokes go over sometimes they don't but is it a break from the norm or a break from reality maybe it is it's 100 you know? a break from reality you can take the the worst situation clark and try to make a joke now that joke didn't land there are plenty of them that did <laughs> you know there are plenty of them you're that not, did. You're not going to bring up Jerry Cooney again, are you? <laughs> well, that wasn't a joke. That was just, <laughs> that was a, uh, I, I can't even say like you missed, you missed that one. That was just, that was an odd situation. But anyway, so, you know, I, I am a big believer laughter is the best medicine. Yes. And we're Without serious doubt. enough in here. We're serious 95% of the time. The other 5% of the time we like to have fun. And if you remember, we did one episode where we brought in two of our friends. and We did the suffering of fun. Why did we do that? Because we needed a whole episode in order to just release all that pent up. Because we do, we do ingest a lot of the things that the guests say. So sometimes they land. Sometimes they don't. We have no control over it, so if we offend anybody, we are we do apologize. But I don't think sometimes they ruffle feathers. Sometimes they don't. <laughs> I can't see us stopping anytime soon, no. so I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, okay, it, it's worked. It has. It's worked. worked so you know, it, it's been successful for us on our drive home. So Roberto underscore Finn, I'm sorry you don't like some of them, but we're going to continue to do it as long as it's appropriate and as long as it fits in as we see it. So why don't, why don't we pick on Roberto then? <laughs> start cracking jokes on him. Can't you just call yourself Robert? <laughs> <laughs> you had to add that O. Yes. Put it in the front. Put that in the front and you'll be O oh, Robert, you'll be Irish. But in all honesty, mm-hmm. Roberto, I do appreciate you sending that question in because we don't want questions that are just layups or softballs. We want some questions that are that are hard to answer. And that that's hard you know, it's hard to take criticism. We know we want negativity too. Yeah. Because right. it's only gonna make us better. So. Correct. If if we're missing something, if there's a blind spot in the way we do things, point it out. We'll, we'll be happy to, to, to answer the question. So keep sending in your questions, and we will try to get them on the air. And while you're at it, go to 234 Franklin Avenue in Nutley, New Jersey. Go see Gus over there at Cubita Cafe. Some of the most delicious food you'll ever have, handmade, perfectly prepared, and made with respect and love. So when you go over there, make sure you tell them the Suffering Podcast sent you. They're supporters of ours, and, of course, we're going to be supporters of theirs. So anyway, Ken... Um, where do we start? <laughs> yeah, you know, I, you you were talking to me on the way in. I didn't hear no stutter. I know. It's still there. <laughs> um, it's just a lot less noticeable. So before we get into any of that stuff, why don't you give us a little window into how you grew up? Grew up in a small town. Um, it's called Newton. Um, about eight thousand. Three hear, schools. You hear some banjos playing from time to time. Sometimes. <laughs> no, Sometimes. I'm only kidding you. I'm only kidding you. A lot of sheep. <laughs> only by Clark's house. <laughs> um, Were you a skier? Because you're right up there by Mountain Creek, right? Yeah. So um, I grew up in Newton. Um, born, raised. Good football Still team. live. Actually, ironically, um, the last four years, um, my nephew is a freshman now. But for the last four years with the football team, he was the kicker, punter, and the quarterback. So, par, uh, my my sons, both my sons, play for Par Seventy Little Vikings, 
and we played them in the playoffs this year. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. Parsippany. You, you know, always. I mean, for a small town, they always have a good football team. They're tough. It's a, so it's, it's a, a tough it's breed. Those, it's a it's those corn fed kids. It's a tough breed. You go up into Sussex <laughs> County, and I'm not I'm not I'm not yeah. knocking them. You yeah. go up into Sussex County. I think High Point had a kid that eighth grade. It's like six foot six, six foot seven. Yeah. Never played. Farm boy. Never played it down. By the way, never played it down. Because he was he was a baby, you know. He outgrew. He his his mind wasn't there. His body was. We have a really good coach, though. Um, he came in, I think, 2016, and these kids would go through a wall for him. Um, my nephew being one of them, and um, he's a really good coach. And when it comes good coach, comes good players, and so it's a really good team. So you grew up there your whole life. What were you What were you into as a kid? Well. I didn't have much of a social life. Um, I stuttered a lot, so had no friends. Um, basically, went to school, went home, ate, and went to bed. And it was very depressing. And um, But you're a big guy, all right? So the football team wasn't your out? No. Um, I wish it was. Um, I had an incident with the wrestling coach at one time. It was probably my fifth grade. And the worst part of a stutterer is actually saying your name and when you go around the room and the tension and the anticipation and just the stress about you saying your name so See, that's, that's why we put your name on the sheet so we don't have to ask you your name thank you You're i really appreciate it <laughs> especially with the k okay try to, try to make you feel welcome well i know so i don't even know where stuttering comes from yeah, exactly. I mean, that that what's what's the genesis? What, is it what's psychological? Is it physical? Well, it depends on who you talk to. Um, I happened when I was eighteen. I went to a speech doctor. He's a famous speech doctor. His name is Martin Swartz. Um, he actually, I don't know if you remember Captain Kangaroo. Oh, yeah, of course, sure. Bob Mr. Keishan. Roger, Bob Keishan. Yep, yeah, Mr. Rogers. They were part of his clients. So what he Wait, says... Mr. Rogers had a stutter? Yes, he did. I didn't know that. That's why he talks in such a monotone because of... He is it, is it overcompensation? It's all in the vocal cords. So what happens with me and what they said is when I was around five and I talked and all of a sudden my vocal cords just locked and they didn't release. So that's what caused my stutter. So when I went to my speech doctor, um, which is a, which is a amazing story how I went there, um, he taught us not so much to, or how to stop your stutter. It's how to prevent it prior to you stuttering. So basically, the vocal cords when you are about to talk, two seconds prior, I let air out which opens up the vocal cords. Because if I didn't do that, my vocal cords would be tense. And then it's like a... How... So that's why nerves and things like that, if you get nervous when, when you're going around the classroom? Yes. <clears throat> yes, it's just tense. Okay? That's what I was going to say. When, when nerves kick up too, you probably have to stutter. You probably stutter a lot. Nerves, I was going to say you have to stutter, but stress, you probably stutter a lot more. Yeah. After, you know, a couple of drinks, you know. Well, so you, I'm, I'm wondering... Because if you saw anybody in a stressful situation, and you were you a retired police officer, so you've seen a lot of stressful situations. Thinking back, I mean, people do have a tendency to stutter when they get nervous. Everybody really stutters. Yeah. Um, it's just happened that they say that either 1% or 2% are really bad stutters in the world. And I just happen to be one of them. Lucky me. Yeah. Um, so when I talk, I always, and this is what the Dr. Swartz stressed and he tried to prevent the stutter before it happened so the two seconds prior to me talking i always let the air out and then it opens my vocal cords he explained it as in what i remember as in a door that got wet and you go to open it and you turn the doorknob and you force the doorknob, and doorknob's turning, but the air's not letting, I mean, the door's not opening up, and then you have to force it open. Well, we used, we that's used to, like a stutter. We used to do that in college, but we used to call it pennying people in. Yes. All right, so yes. I don't know if you ever, if you know what that is. 
So for those young people out there that aren't maybe that as, are about to go to college, that aren't as maybe <laughs> mischievous, those big metal doors in the college dorms, if you press them, the door, the, the latch would lock. It would friction lock. And then you shove pennies in there and they can't get out. Right, that's it's funny. Funny, funny yes. as hell. But that, that makes – see, that makes a lot of sense here, which is different from, let's say, like a lisp, which is more the way your tongue hits your palate. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, there, there's – I can't imagine what somebody goes through when they have this, this thing going on with them that they're not proud of. You're obviously not proud of it. And then you got to put it out there and you have to you, – you, you have to be in normal society – with everybody looking at you, because your kids are kids are brutal. I was just gonna say same thing. Kids are brutal. It had to be a tough upbringing because kids are brutal. You're talking about the 1970s and 80s before Hib, <laughs> before um, harassment, before anti-bullying. Um, they were bad, and it's not only the kids; it was the teachers. Well, can you mimic how you used to stutter sure. when you were a kid? Um, just for the audience. Yeah, well, no, yeah I, thank you. I'm, 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 I'm That's ve- a punchline. Yeah. I'm very interested because I need to get. Some, I want to get some backstory on how bad it actually was. Basically, it's a, and it would last two minutes, three minutes. It would take two to three, sometimes four minutes, in order um, for one word to get out. Um, a sentence sometimes took me even longer. And now, now your frustration is going up. My frustration. So you're probably even concentrating more on it. And how I tried to get rid of it was I stopped my foot, slapped my head. Um, yes. So, um, it was somebody trust kick you. Yes. You know, (laughs) right in the ass. Sort of, sort of snap you in. I know it sounds cruel. You had to have a wingman. (laughs) <laughs> sort of, Smack your back. Sort of snap out. you out of it. I wish I did. But then, you know, there's humor in it. And even to this day, there's humor in it. I was just watching My Cousin Vinny. All right. And there's an actor who's, he's got a really bad stutter, but he, I don't know whether he puts it on or he just can turn it on and off. But you remember the lawyer, the yeah. first lawyer they had? And he goes up there and he, the next, the next time he goes up there, he can't get a word out. <laughs> and the, the two defendants are standing there going, oh my God. Mm-hmm. Oh my God. But it's funny. It's funny. But when, that, when you're not going through it, that's right. a guy who has come to terms with it. As a kid, I don't think you you have the mental capability to no. come to terms with anything that's wrong. Yeah, especially for me because I had no support. Um, I was one of I was a younger child, the youngest. Um, my father, who was a retired cop, but at that time he was a cop. My mom was a nurse. So they were always at work. So I was the youngest. So I think I was raised by Elio's Pizza, <laughs> Laura's Ingalls on <laughs> Spam, Little House on a Prairie. Actually, was my <laughs> babysitter. Laura Ingalls. Yeah, Laura Ingalls. You know, the worst was actually going to a restaurant because I think up until the age of seventeen, I never had what I wanted at a restaurant because <laughs> you just used to pick something off the menu because you couldn't hamburger. Say it. <laughs> Damn, I want a cheese on that. <laughs> um, so it's like, in hope, in hope, they yeah. asked me if I wanted French fries. You could shake your so, head. So, you know, and I remember leaving school, um, going down the road. We used to have a place that's called Newton Pizza. So after school, I used to walk in and I used to raise my hand one. And they knew I wanted a number one sub. So it was like no talking. And that's how I pretty much gone through my childhood at restaurants. I basically had a hamburger or I just pointed and hoped they asked if I wanted a supersized. <laughs> so if you didn't want any onions on it, you're out of luck. I'm screwed. Yeah. <laughs> but so t- let's get into the kids. The kids were probably pretty cruel to you. What is some of the things that these kids belted out to you? Well, I'm sure you've been called stupid before. Right, because in the, in the, would say, 70s and 80s, they didn't really know what stuttering was all about. It's funny because my second grade. The key component to any law enforcement officer being the best version of themselves is through education. Sherry Alsop is a leader in providing that education to police agencies, preparing them for the all too frequent dealings with sexual assault victims. You've seen Sherry on episode 169 of the Suffering Podcast. 
She survived incest and almost daily sexual assault, so she comes from a place of experience and true understanding. Sherry has the intelligence, commitment, and compassion to open the eyes of those on the front lines while providing the tools to effectively deal with a difficult situation. Sherry's instruction comes from experience and multiple certifications. Training with Sherry will offer on-site training, customized schedules, specialized instruction tailored from a victim's perspective. You are going to hear Sherry's heart-wrenching but inspiring survivor story. Learn proprietary trauma-informed training techniques. Uncovered victim-centered interview methods while earning continuing education credits according to your state guidelines. To be the best, you must learn from the best. Let Sherry also guide you through the delicate cases of sexual assault from a victim's point of view. Be a source of comfort to those victims affected by these traumatic experiences while producing a solid investigation and uncovering details that often go unnoticed. To find out more or to contact Sherry Alsop, go to SherryAlsop.com. That's S-H-E-R-R-I-E-A-L-L-S-U-P.com. They, I think I was the only one or the worst one in the school system that ever had a stutter. So in second grade, they had no idea what to do with me. So they actually, at that year, I actually broke my leg. So I think they used that as an excuse for me to stay back because they, they thought I had a learning you know, disability. And it wasn't that. It just I had a stutter and I couldn't talk. So, and at that time... Porky Pig was popular. Oh, dear oh, Lord. Oh, yeah. So here comes the nickname. So I can see all my <laughs> friends watching this going to call me Porky Pig now. So um, Which Porky Pig. is not a flattering <laughs> thing to be called a pig. No, it's not. It's not. So that's what I was called, Porky Pig. Um, they used to make fun of me, you know, just mocking me. Um, you, Looney Tunes. So Daffy Duck had a, was it Daffy Duck had a, had a stutter too? He had a stutter in a, in a wisp. lisp. Yeah, lisp. Yeah, yeah, lisp. yeah. yeah. So. God, like Warner Brothers is some assholes. I know. Yeah. <laughs> they placated to the, the, that sector of society back then in, in kids. They were know? bullies. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Jeez. I, you know what? I That just totally opened my eyes to that. You're going to go home and watch Looney Tunes yeah. tonight. I say we all boy, boycott Space Jam. Space Jam. <laughs> yeah, Space Jam. But that that's a horrible thing, and, and it weighs on you. And then the more it happens, the, the, the tougher it gets. You, Compounding. You don't want to. I shut down. My final breaking point was in fifth grade. Um, we had to, that's when they just came out with the video cameras. It's, it was like. Oh, the, the shoulder mounted ones. Was, yes. With the VHS tape the VHS in the, video, disc, it in the like, camera. It was like a brick. <clears throat> so we had to stand in front of it and we had to do like a presentation. Wow. Yeah. So I was really into pro wrestling. Okay. That was my crutch, only because I always wanted to be like them. Because I don't know if you guys watch pro wrestling, but they can talk. They have the gift of gab. They're big. They're strong, especially back in the 80s and 90s. So um, Before they started testing for steroids. Before they started testing. <laughs> so, we just had this conversation yeah. before. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to get my pro wrestling book. I'm going to talk about it. And they said, action. And I froze, and then the k -k 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 started coming out, and the teacher and the teacher's aide started laughing. Oh, my gosh. And this is in fifth grade. And that was my final breaking point because when they started laughing, everybody else started laughing. It's got to be demoralizing, too. It was. And I still remember this as in it was yesterday. And that was my final breaking point. And that's when I gave up on myself. I gave up on anything that I ever wanted to do. And this is fifth grade. Yeah. And I just, it just broke me. When you're supposed to have all these hopes and dreams of doing something great with your life. Absolutely. And it was then I just, I shut down. I didn't talk. Um, I didn't care. I didn't do my homework because the reason why I didn't do my homework is I knew they weren't going to call on me because that's the worst too knowing that they're going to like ask you to read out loud and all the kids are rolling their eyes because they want to go to lunch and the teacher wants to go to lunch. So after a while, they just didn't even know I was in the room. I think every kid has something 
about them that they're not very proud of that they that, so some kids are able to own it. Like, Mike, did you ever have anything that you're not proud of when you were, say, 11 years old? I'm half Irish. <laughs> well, besides that, well, stop pulling down your pants in front of everybody. I'm going to tell you what mine is. Like, I had a bad, I've had a bad stomach my whole life. So I used to fart in school all the time. And sometimes at times when you don't want to. So what did I start doing? You know, and <laughs> you, you do it once by accident and kids will make fun of you. So what did I start doing? I started doing it on purpose. Everywhere to I went. To make it a joke. It was a, I made it a joke because I'm like, you know, I'd, I'd go and fart on somebody. And I know it sounds, it's funny. Farts are always funny, but not, not to the person who can't control it. Right. You know, it starts, but uh, so I owned it. I owned it and I just, I, I had to not care, but it did, it did bother me. It absolutely bothered me because I, my parents were feeding me shit at home and I just, my stomach was killing me. Right. Um, and I really couldn't control, control either. It's one you, of the, it's you one probably, of the, you, knowing you, like I know you now, you probably enjoyed it. I got, like, watch like, this. I'm going to crop dust people. You walk right through a crowd and just fart and. No. So smells. if it was silent, it would be, pro, it would be, a, it would be fine. Like if you just stuttered a little bit, you could live with it. Right. No, mine were like trumpets. <laughs> <laughs> there was no hiding. It's not like your your ass was stuttering. Yeah. <laughs> See, and we no, that's go, funny. and we go on with the jokes. Um, and thanks, Roberto, for the question, the social media question. Yeah, but that, but you've gotten beaten down for so long, and you've been self conscious about this for so long. I don't think there was any way that you could own this. No, and um, I just sat and. I just watched the my youth just go by me. Well, especially in fifth grade, because you don't even you don't have a, a, a concept of reality at that point. No. You don't know what the world's all about. You don't you know why am I different from other people? Yeah, and nobody ever came up to you and and befriended you a little bit. Like, there's did nobody. I had a few um, that actually spoke to me, but not as I mean. We were friends, but nothing to hang out with. No sleepovers. No, or no, yeah, no, no, none of that stuff. No sleepover. I mean, once school ended, I just, as I said, I walked down the street. I went to Newton Pizza. It's funny because the first time I really talked on the phone, I was actually twenty-one years old. What? First wow. time I talked on the phone. The only time that I talked on the phone was my mom was a nurse and she worked. Three to 11s. So I used to go home, and that's when we had the phone on the wall. Mm -hmm. With a nine foot cord. With a nine foot cord. So. And and the the rotary dial. Yep. So I got home about quarter of three. I knew she was calling at three. I used to pull the couch over, used to stand on the couch. When the phone rang, I picked it up. And when I landed, I said, hello hung the phone up and that's when my mom knew I was home. And that's the only communication I had on the phone until I was basically 21 years old. Now, at this point, did your parents ever step in and try to give you a little bit of support? Or no. What was their reaction to all this stuff? They said I was outgrowing it. Huh. I heard I heard that from so many people. I really didn't have a speech teacher until my eighth grade year. They tried to help me, um, and they sent me to what they said was a speech class. But, like, I n- remember my third grade, it was the cafeteria worker. <laughs> so you I knew. spoke Spanish. Lunch anyway. lady land. <laughs> I knew mm. when we were going to have pizza. That was my, you know, <laughs> highlight. So I didn't have a real speech teacher until I was in eighth grade. But by that time, I already gave up on myself. See, I. When I was naming my kids, I went through all those things. Because I was a little shithead when I was little. So I went through all those things in my head. I'm like, okay, we got to be careful what we name them because teasing is going to come. And, you know, my, my oldest son's name's Patrick. We call him Pat, right? And I said, well, it kid better not be fat. <laughs> right? That, that, and and dead ser- I'm dead serious with that. And there was a great skit on um, Saturday Night Live with Nicolas Cage where – 
you know, they're, they're a couple's naming their baby and Pat can't name him Pat, fat Pat. And every name that she came up with, he thought of something. And then the guy delivery guy comes to the door and he goes, I got a package for ass wipe Johnson. (laughs) And he goes, it's as we pay. Um, but, but something as, as small as that, I was, I was conscious of it. So for your parents not to step in and say, Hey, listen, yes, he may outgrow it, but let's get him some help. Let's get him something in order to try to make it through because they had to see how lonely you were. Yes. And, but again, it was a different time. It was the 70s and 80s. So, yeah, but I mean, parental sympathy. Yeah. Something, yeah. you know, your, your kid stubs his toe. You're going to be doting on the kid. Yep. You know, if your kid's going through this, this, this lifelong thing of stuttering and loneliness and yeah, no, you don't think yeah, they'd yeah. step in and say something. Now, just to fast forward a little bit, do you have children? No, but I do have a nephew that has lived with me since he's been four. So, okay. so you have an now. His on, name's not S. White Bay, is it? No, it's Robert. <laughs> it's, <laughs> S. White Teats. It's got a nice. Yes, it's got a nice ring to it. Um, but you, so you look out for those things because of where you came from. I actually feel sorry for him because I am so tough on him, and it's because of my upbringing. Like. He plays three sports. He has not missed a practice since he's been a freshman because I won't allow that because he's I like that. He's doing something that I couldn't do. And he's not going to give up on himself. And a lot of people tell me maybe you're a little too hard on him, but he's playing college lacrosse. Um, I think he was ranked number two in the state last year. As a kicker, um, he's a very tremendous three-sport athlete. And I think the reason why is because I was so hard on him. And I continue to be hard. And the reason why is the because he's given an opportunity that I'd never had. So you want to make sure he capitalizes on it. Yes. And especially, it's funny because my wife is all about the education, which I am too. But I'm like, you're going to be... In sports. So he gets it from both ends. My wife with the schoolwork and me with the sports. The bre- the best parental preparation story I ever heard. You know the comedian Brad Williams is a little person? Yep. Okay. He's funny. He's, he is. He's hilarious. So did you ever hear about how his dad raised him? So he, they knew he was a little person. So his dad started preparing him for when he was going to school. So he, he says it very clearly because my dad was my first bully. But he did it in such a way he, he would say he would say something to him about being a little person. He's like, all right, give it back to me. Give it back to me. And he prepared him for when he does go to school, knowing that he's going to get bullied and oh, wow. he's going to get made fun of. And he goes, I was down in the principal's office all the time because the first time somebody came up to me and said, hey, you're you're little, you're a midget. He looked at the kid and he goes, well, your mother doesn't live with your father anymore. <laughs> and, he, and he was just, he was prepared. He had all these right. jokes. And, and uh, I think our job as, as people who raise children is to prepare those kids for those difficult times yes. as best we can. We, we can't do everything, but as best as we can. And, you know, I don't know your parents. I don't know what, what their deal was. But, man, I don't know if that's the right way to do it. In hindsight, I didn't give them the opportunity to help me because I was very sheltered. And I was going to say, you said you shut down too. So you I probably, shut down you 100%. Didn't want the help at right. that point. I didn't want anybody's help. In fact, um, when I went with my first speech teacher, my first true speech teacher in eighth grade, we used to have a staring contest because it was like two months every day for 43 minutes. I sat across her and she tried to help me and I wouldn't. And all of a sudden she just said, okay, we're done. You need to leave. So I got up and I shrugged my shoulders and started walking. But this is what actually changed my life. Um, Five years later, she goes, if you ever want to change, come back and I will help you. Well, she could well hunt in you. Yes. That's exactly what she did. If you ever want the help you need, I'm here for you. And my senior year... um, I was running because I lost a lot of weight. The movie Rocky. Now, across from Newton Pizza, there was a video store, a true 
VHS video store. And it's always been there, but I never went in there because I couldn't rent a video because I couldn't talk. So you go in and you get five different videos. <laughs> so I'm sorry. <laughs> so I walked in and I saw the movie Rocky. I mean, I saw the poster of Sylvester Stallone and Rocky. It was a Friday night. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to rent this. So I put it. I wrote down my name, wrote down my address, gave him my money, watched Rocky that night. And when you watch Rocky, Rocky is a boxing movie. But I didn't watch for some reason from everything happens for a reason. I do believe that. That's what's written on my mug. I watched the movie as I was Rocky Balboa. Rocky Balboa had the ability, he had the talent, and nobody gave him a chance. Until somebody, as a joke, said, hey, I'm going to fight him because of his name. The Italian Stallion. The Italian Stallion. So, I'm watching a movie, but I'm watching a movie as Rocky Balboa. Round 14, when he was getting his his ass kicked, and he kept on coming back up. Something kicked me in the ass. And I don't know if it's fate. I don't know if it was a higher power. I don't know. Something's like, you need to get off your ass. So the next day, I got a pair of sweatpants, gray sweatpants. I didn't actually do the egg, okay? I was going to say you didn't move to Philadelphia. Too, did I you? didn't move to Philadelphia. <laughs> and I started running. And I started losing a lot of weight. Then I started getting dumbbells. So one day, and I'm very OCD. That's one thing that I think... Through being sheltered, um, I... Well, that's what made your life make sense. Yes. Good point. It's what, it's yeah. what made your... Because I'm, I'm OCD, right? <laughs> I, I am. I'm very OCD on a lot of stuff. As I'm like this with the mug. Right. <laughs> it, because when, when you live in chaos, those things around you that are steadfast and, and, and always there, they make, they make sense to you. Yeah. All right? the, the little things. Yep. You know, like putting a piece of paper yeah. like this. Yep. You know, it's got to be perfectly aligned. So, and my wife is the opposite of OCD, which drives me unbelievably crazy. Which makes it perfect because oh. she leaves things out of order, and your life gets back yes, in order. Put back. Putting... So then I started running, and I ran the same route every day. Well, this time there was an accident, so the road was shut off. Now I had a choice: I could either take the actually the easy way because it was a flat way to the left or I could go to the right and go up the big hill which happened to be my middle school so I'm like screw it I'm going to go up the hill so I started running up the hill and as I'm running past the school I stopped and watching Forrest Gump ironically mm-hmm. it was just when he was running and he just stopped yeah. well that I think I'll go home now I think I'll go <laughs> home now that that's what I picture me what I did. And I'm like, I want help. And I thought to myself, if I can change the appearance on the outside, why can't I control what's in the inside? I went down the sidewalk to go into the school because my speech teacher, four years later, or four years prior, 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 said, if you ever need help, well, I wanted help. Ironically, she was walking out. And I'm like, so we went to the classroom. She gave me a book, Dr. Swartz. I run home. The problem was I had the name and a phone number of a guy that can change my life. Problem is I don't talk on the phone. So I wrote a letter. And I wish I still had that letter. I mean. That would be a nice little keepsake. It would yeah. be. Three months later, I was said, yes. You can come to my, you know, speech class. So it was nine days in Manhattan. It was during, happened to be during my spring break. So I hopped a Lakeland bus. Didn't even tell my parents. Hopped a Lakeland bus. I drove to... um, (laughs) Where'd Ken go? He ran away to go. (laughs) Well, ironically, like four days later, I think the... One of the employees had to call my house to tell them where I was. So, uh, 
So you aren't a missing juvenile at this point. No, now only, I was eighteen. Now the only problem is not only do you have a stutter, but you got a broken ass. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so nine days, I went. I stayed in a hotel, and I basically learned how to talk again. And uh, leading up to this point, what, did you have any other unhealthy coping mechanisms? I ate. I ate a lot. Um, Self esteem was none. And that's well, what you're 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 nothing but a car going downhill yep. where the steering doesn't work. There's no point in using the brakes. And you know, the brakes go. aren't working either. Yeah. Just go. So I just ate. And as I said, every day I I got a big whole sub. And that was my crutch, I think. The so. number one from Newton subs. Newton pizza. Newton pizza. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> so you learn, you go to this this speech therapy. What is something that they taught you that sort of clicked? The airflow. So oh, what you were saying before about yeah. the parallel. Yes. Yeah. So what they did was, um, when the doctor walked into the room, he was the most what I remember the most arrogant prick I ever met. But until you came on this show, yes. you met two of them. <laughs> but don't leave Andrew out of this. <laughs> it was like he was like a drone instructor because he's like, if you don't want to be here, leave. Oh, he's definitely like the police academy. Yes. Um, because there's a lot more people that want to be here because I will help you and you will leave here more fluent. So if you're not going to give 100 percent, go now. So I'm like, so the nine other people who I was with, they're like standing back too. But he had us actually, we had to call restaurants um, and order stuff, which was really hard for me because, as I said, I never used a phone. We we walked around Manhattan with buttons that said, ask me a question, I'm a stutter. Yeah. Imagine that. Wow, that's, that's, that's trial that's, by fire. That's yes. tough love right yes, there. Yes, tough love. We went to restaurants, um, and we just practiced for 12 hours, and it was just like being in the academy. We were just like – but what they did was they gave us like a pager, and it was countdown. So every 30 seconds, we had to breathe. And we did that for like three days, every 30 seconds. And then when we started talking, we had to push the button. And that taught us that said, okay, you need to breathe. So that's what he basically taught us how to, you know, the airflow technique. That, you know, in a lot of ways, I just, I think he really believed in what he did. And he knew this was going to change things. Now, plus, so when you're around other stutterers like this, did you finally drop your guard a hair? Um, yes, but I was like, come on, get it out. <laughs> <laughs> All of a sudden, your I'm, stutter's not so bad? I'm such a hypocrite. <laughs> <laughs> like, wow, I, I got a problem. A this problem, motherfucker yeah. is a stutter. He started calling people stupid. And <laughs> yeah. Hey, Porky, Porky come pig. on. Yeah. Porky pig. Hey, Porky, come on. But it, it had to have... It, I mean, you were probably never around another stutterer no, when you were growing up. I was so this not. is the first time you were actually in a group with stutterers. My father did a little bit, especially when he was drinking. Um, but Don't he we all? wasn't. Yeah. Don't we all? <laughs> but he wasn't like as I mean, Pronounced. not as bad as me, yeah. you know. So. So you go through this process and nine days. Now, in nine days, are you cured? No. And this is why. Getting back to my nephew, I'm um, being so tough on him because I had to practice every single day. Every single day I had to practice. Not only did I have to practice, but I had to prove people wrong. And I still do that. And that's probably one of my downfalls because I will never let my guard down. I'm saying you still probably practice every day, too. Every it's, day. It's, it's on your – every time you open your – like, yes. like you said, don't take this the wrong way, no. but every time you open your mouth, it's got to be in the back of your mind. Absolutely. Especially being a police officer. Yeah, without a doubt. You know, and I had a lot of naysayers. Actually, getting hired, it took me 10 years in order to get hired. I took three service service tests, and it took one guy, which at that time was the captain, 
to give me the chance. And if it wasn't for him, I probably wouldn't be here. To tell you the truth, what, I would not what, be here. What led you down the road to law enforcement? My father was a cop. My father was a cop for 25 years. He was a lieutenant. He was... Even that legacy didn't help you out? No, because I had a reputation. Because it's a small town. Mm -hmm. And I had the reputation of being Bill's son, the stutterer. So when, even though I went to the class, even though I practiced every single day to bust my ass, I still had that reputation. That and this is that stigma. Yes. And this is where I try to teach everyone, especially the young kids. Once you get a reputation, it's so hard to get rid of. But something had to change in you where you started to come to terms with who you are, come become comfortable in your own skin and own it. Because I know you go out and do some stuff now that is way out of your comfort zone that you would have never done at that time. So it, was there a point where you're like, okay, that's right. I am a stutter. What are you going to do about it? I think when I took my first test, when I took my first test as a civil service, I'm like, you know what? I'm going to do this. I can do this. I do stutter. Um, I'm going to own up to it because there's no hiding it, especially when they go to your elementary school, they go to your middle school, they go to your high school when you fill out the application. So they all know who you are. And I'm like, yes, this is me. Unfortunately, um, I had some people that were against me, not because they didn't like me. They just thought I couldn't do the job. But they probably didn't know you because you didn't open up to people. Yes. Well, um, let me ask you that question. So let's say you still had your stutter severe. Do you think you could have done the job as a police officer? No. Not at all. But they, at that time, I had to prove to myself. So what I did was I was turning 28, and that's the cutoff. So I actually went down to the police station, and I spoke to the captain, which his name is eventually became the chief. His name was John Tomasola. And I spoke to him and I said, listen, give me a chance as a dispatcher. So I'm asking, just give me a wow. chance. That's a big leap right there. Give me a chance to oh, prove wow. myself to you and to the other people. Because I knew I could do it. He was the only one that ever gave me a chance. Because everybody else were like, what are you nuts? There's no way he's going to be doing it. He hired me as a part-time dispatcher. I then became full-time in a year and a half. I became a police officer. Even though that I did a dispatching, I still had some of the officers still downing my ability, which just drove me even more. It, it just drove me. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to do this. And when I took the test, I got hired me and three other people, and he gave me the chance, which he didn't have to, and he did. So you always have that one person, that one coach, that one teacher that always has faith in you who will give you the opportunity, and mine was John Tomasola. We all need that one person yep. in our life just to give us a chance. Yep. That's so it. I ask. Just one person open the door for you. Yep. Yeah. But then, now, did you send people to the wrong address? Like, if it was 24 Main Street, you'd send oh, them, like, 224 two, Main Street. Uh, what's <laughs> that's funny. But that's, <laughs> yeah, but that's I, why I, I asked. No wonder it took me a year and a half to get hired. <laughs> that's why I asked that question. Like, if you still had a severe stutter, that's what, you know, because there are certain jobs that I'm, like, I'm not going to be an acrobat. It's just not in the cards. <laughs> but you know, um, the, the thing is, that was such a leap to be a dispatcher. Oh, my because gosh. Because you could be on top of your game at all points. I mean, you get that 911 call. Yeah. You know, you can't be sitting there. I'm you starting know, you, to see you a pattern. I'm you starting to see a hanging in balance. I'm starting to see a pattern with you, Ken. So your mind is, is for good and for bad. Your mind defeated you when you were young, but then you started... And that strength that, that strength that your mind had to be able to push you down and shut you down and defeat you... 
is the same power you use to o- start overcoming. And when you overcame one thing, hey, I can do this. Then they overcame another thing, I can do this, and so forth and so on. Yes. That's, that's uh, you, you started using your suffering for good. You know, that ability to take so much crap and overcome it. My hat's off to you. It, it seems the power he didn't have as a, as a child was amplified yeah. and became one of your most powerful. I did have a turning point, though. Um, I think it was like I think the second time that I took the test and they skipped over me. Now it's going to get dark a little bit. I'm sitting in my apartment and my friend loaned me a CD. It was from a hair band called Trickster. I know Trickster very well. Steve Brown's a very good friend of mine. Steve Brown. Pete Lawrence, Steve Brown. Steve know, Brown saved my life. Okay? I know Steve Brown very well. In fact, I finished the story. I'll tell you a story about Steve. So it's the old sound system, you know, with the tear mm-hmm. system and the big ass speakers. So my friend loaned me. And I'm literally, I remember sitting in a corner. Now, I haven't told nobody this, actually. Maybe one or two, but I'm sitting in a corner of my apartment, okay? And I'm thinking, this is over, okay? Because I, my dream just ended because they hired somebody else. So I'm looking over at a knife on my kitchen counter. So I'm playing the music, and it's a song by Trickster. It's called On and On. No, well. Save my life. That lyrics, or those lyrics in that song hit me. Every word hit me. Basically saved my life. Because I don't know what I would have done if I did not hear that song. So... Forward 20 years later, I'm at Newton Theater. Another hair band, Mr. Big, is there. <laughs> which which <clears throat> sings the most fucked up song in the world. Which one? The the I want to be the next. I just want to wait on the line to be the next B with you. Yes. They're running a train on the poor girl. <laughs> That's the most fucked up song I ever heard in my life. So, I can't, we're talking something serious here. I he, understand like that. Yeah, but he's the funny one. <laughs> Mr. Big, Mr. Big standing in line to be the next yeah. to be with a girl. So I'm looking over. So the lead singer, Eric Morton, comes out, sees me in uniform because I'm working, and goes, how you doing? It just, couldn't be the nicer guy. And I just look over and I see PJ, the bass player from Trickster. Now, you have to be a big Trickster fan to know who the bass player is. And know PJ, especially, he looks a lot different now. So I'm starting to talk to PJ. And I said, listen, your song saved my life. So he's letting me talk, you know. And I'm sure that, you know, a lot of people wanted to talk to him. So I give him my number with my business card. I'm like, hey, if you ever Newton, ever get pulled over, use my name. There you go. (laughs) So... The next day, he texts me and says, hey, this is PJ. Awesome talking to you. He goes, this is Steve Brown's number. Call him, text him, tell him your story. So I did. And wouldn't you know, like six hours later, Steve Brown's talking to me. Leaves a message. Six months later, I go to his house. Okay. Paramus? No, Ringwood. So, I think it's Ringwood. So, I go to, I start talking to him, and I'm like, guy, you you basically saved my life, okay? So then, two years later, I go to one of his concerts. I just retired. So, they give me a shout-out. The first time they sang that song on and on since 1991 is when I came to the show when I retired. And I was going to say, where was the show? I, if it was in Jersey, I was probably there. So I used to go to all of them. It was at um, Teaneck. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Don't Me- Mexicali Live. Yes. yes. It changed the name. Yeah, it changed yeah. the name. Yeah. So 
I was probably at that show because I, I went to see him a couple times. You see, they're great. They're great. So, and he's been, they've been so nice to me. Him and PJ. Um, Pete Lauren. Yes. Mark Scott. So I couldn't be, you know, happier with how they were to me. So um, that's just a side note but, story. But if you think about it, if you never, I know stuttering has been rough on your life, but if you never stuttered, just think about where that took you. That story right there, and I'm sure there's other things involved as well, other other incidents like this. If you would have never stuttered, we say this a lot here. If Mike and I were never in a police shooting, we would never be here. I like being here. If you didn't stutter, I'm not going to say this is one of your highlights of your life, but you would have never you would have never sat in front of Trickster. No, and this is a highlight. <laughs> Believe me, no. Did this, this, Can we this, gotta get you some better memories? I was gonna say if he never opened his mouth to PJ. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this is awesome now. But <clears throat> but yeah, um, but that's really I'm cool. Very fortunate. The things I have done, um, the speeches that you know. So when you go out and talk, do you specifically talk about stuttering or the effects of self being self conscious as a child? Confidence. Everything happens for a reason, and reputation. And how to reach your dreams. That's what I basically talk about. Because um, if I can reach one person, because I never had that. And the school system didn't have the support staff they do now. They didn't bring in speakers. I mean, we're lucky that we got to see a fire truck doing fire prevention. Okay, That was a high life of, you know. So when I do the talks, I basically talk about how to reach your dream and don't let anybody say you can't do it because I'm a living proof. If I let all the people who said I couldn't be a cop, there's no way that I would be a cop because I had people going through their woodworks. Oh, I remember him in school. Yeah. I remember, he can't be a cop. And... 25 years later, I'm great? living off wouldn't a pension. It, wouldn't it be great if you pulled one of those people over? Listen, motherfucker. Actually, <laughs> I'm going to give you a ticket. Living <clears throat> in the town that I work in, going to school, I only dealt with one person that brought up about my past. And I'm looking at him, I'm like, hey, jerk off, you're the ones in handcuffs. <laughs> so. You can make fun of me all you want. I win. <laughs> yeah, you know. I win. This, but this there's only one story, person now. Your bullying story. Oh, you know, it's a it's a sad thing too because you're you you seem like a really great guy, okay? And those people who were not so kind to you over your life or put you down and told you you couldn't, they really lost out. It's their loss. Like I, I'm sure when you were a kid, you thought it was your loss that you couldn't be involved in that. Like, but but moving forward as an adult, all these things that you've accomplished, it's their loss. You know, it's it's. I I am fortunate enough to understand what my loss was by being such an asshole as a kid, and and there was a reason why I was an asshole as a kid. <laughs> He's not talking about later in life either. Yeah, there was a reason <laughs> for it. It was it was I wasn't okay at home, so I took it out on everybody else. And but Ken, you you got an amazing story. Um, is there any plugs that you want to you want to throw out? You give out your social media, of course. I want to, I want people to find you. Yes, and um, I'm now a bartender at O'Reilly's. It's a Irish pub in Newton. <laughs> Stop by and see me. A little bit of a hike uh, for me. But oh, my yeah. gosh. You couldn't be any more stereotypical. Irish cop, now working as a bartender. Uh, it, it's well, – What's the other place, Irish Cottage Inn? Yeah, that's, that's in Franklin. Yeah, that's in Franklin. Yeah, that's yeah. about a half hour away from yeah. us. But I always want to be a bartender because of the show Cheers and Coach. Coach, Coach is the best. I just wanted to sit and sling bears and talk sports. I just wanted. But see, to... I mean, that, that, that's another hurdle now. Now you got to talk to people on a regular basis. But I love it. Oh, good for you. I um, you, you've overcome it then. Well, you spent part of your life being silent. I spent in shelter, and now I won't shut up. It's, <laughs> now it's pent up. Shut up. I won't shut up. He wants to I come just... back on a podcast tomorrow and tell us <laughs> yes, more stories. Yes, I do. I want to, just, you know. But now, um, yeah, so um, if I can help out anyone, you know, by all means, you know, just give me a shout. But just, just getting back to it real quick. Well, don't, we don't... never gave out your social media. Oh, no, go ahead. it's Katie's. Um, We're going to put a link to it as well. Yeah, that's my Facebook. I'm on Instagram. Um, I think it's Ken Teets. 
just getting back to it real quick. When you were listening to that Trickster song and you saw that knife on the shelf, were you ever suicidal as a, as a young no. kid? No. No. I, I should say I don't remember. I could have been. I may have blocked it out. But I don't recall ever being suicidal as a kid. Um, but I could have blocked it out too. But I'm saying you probably you, you had to be a miserable existence. So you probably yes. just want to say, you know, why am I here? Yeah, you know, it's, it's me and my dog Fido. <laughs> that was my friend. Dog yeah. doesn't care whether you stutter. I didn't stutter in front of my dog. <laughs> the dog <laughs> didn't stutter in front of you, did nope. <laughs> Bef- we're 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 coming to the <clears throat> end of this thing here, but before we go, I, I want to ask one question because I know that there are certain people who stutter, but they can sing perfectly. Yeah. And that's Mel, 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 Mel Tillis. Mel Tillis. Mel Tillis. Mel Tillis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's because of the airflow technique. Because of the, so it's the same concept. It's the same concept. Do you remember Stuttering John from Howard Stern? Of course. He used to sing too. Yeah. So the, uh, well, no, that's Billy Ocean. He just didn't speak English. <laughs> he didn't speak English, but he sang beautifully. Yeah. I was going to say Elton John stuttered too. I don't know. It was that song Benny and the Jets. <laughs> <laughs> it's like Shecky Green over here. <laughs> So I can, I'm sorry. I'm just, no, that's okay. I'm sorry. That's okay. So Ken, we we are coming to the end of this okay. thing here, and you got this amazing journey that, that you got to be ultra proud of. Wasn't always that way, but I know you've learned some stuff from all those things that you went through as a child and stuttering the way you did, shutting down to finally getting some help and taking your life back. But it had to teach you something. So what do you think your suffering has taught you? Everything happens for a reason. There's a reason why I'm here today. There's a reason why I Because you to, know Clark. Because I know Clark. <laughs> there's a he reason, got the number from Clark. So called. <laughs> there's a reason why I had to go through the pain and suffering, maybe because someone won't have to. So when I do my talks, hopefully I had to do or – I had to deal with the pain and suffering and not let somebody else do it. What he said, God gives his battles to his toughest soldiers. Yes. You know, no. and, and you know, it's funny too. He was so nervous to come in here, came in with all his notes. <laughs> didn't even look at his notes once. Well, that's, that's what I tell people. So we have these, we have these <laughs> outlines. Right? That, yeah. We have these outlines here. If I ask you every question on this outline, it's going to be a really yeah. shitty interview. Okay. Ken, number one, introduction. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you number know, two, social media questions. I did have um, a lot of people um, on my side. Well, not a lot of people, but I had a few people that were on my side. And one is my wife, Michelle. Um, We've been married for 21 years, and she's been through, you know, my beginning of my up and down as a police officer. And, you know, my best friend, Dan Finkel, um, he's like my right-hand man, you know. and Captain Thomas Ula. Chief Thomas Sola. Chief yep. Thomas Chief Thomas well, Sola. He was the captain. You said he was the captain. Yeah. Yep. Now he's a chief. Um, he recently passed away, and yeah. what sucks about the whole thing with him dying—not only that he passed away, but he, he actually died during COVID, so he didn't have the send off that he really deserved, yeah. and that really bothers me because for what he has done for my life, I mean, he's the reason why I'm here, I'm here today, and. But by you doing what you're doing, you are honoring him. Yes. You're honoring his legacy right there. Yes, because I mention him in every speech I do. And um, I owe the utmost, you know, gratitude for, I mean, you know, with him. So, and all the sports coaches that um, who allowed me to be a part of a team, because I never was a part of a team, always wanted to be, but... So I think my biggest regret is not joining the military because I wanted always to be a part of a team. So when my nephew was going through high school sports, the high school coach, Coach Prozero, the basketball coach, Dirk Kelly, and the lacrosse coach, Coach Colucci, they allowed me to be part of the team. Um, I was the overpaid water boy for them. I was a photographer and they allowed me to be part of the team and I will never forget what they have allowed me to do. And also I would like to um, say the athletic director, Mr. Hatchway, Ryan Hatchway, because if it wasn't for him, I would never be allowed to do what I did. 
I will tell you this, Ken. So although you say you're never part of a team, you're now part of our family. Oh, thank you. All that right? means a lot. And, and I was going to say, you said a lot of people had your back back in the day. Guess what? You got two more to have your That's back That's awesome. Anymore. Well, you guys, thank you so much. Have your back. All right. Um, two guys who will make the most inappropriate, well, one guy will make the most inappropriate jokes at the worst times. You did too. You I did, did too. I, you did. Thank you. I did not. Thank you. Mine were all done with love. It's a difference. The Elton John one hurt me a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for coming in. Guys, I want to thank you. This was awesome. Ken, I had a, a pleasure, great time. It thank was a you. pleasure. I, I'm just happy that you, you got through this and you're outspoken about it and you're helping other people. That's thank amazing. you. I really appreciate it. And that's going to do it for this episode of The Suffering Podcast, The Suffering of a Stutter with Ken Teets. And let's think about all the stuff that we learned. Kids can be cruel. One chance is all you need. If you want it bad enough, you're going to practice to get it. Anything is possible if you put your mind to it. Never let anyone tell you you can't do it. But most importantly, everything, and I mean everything, happens for a reason. And that's going to do it for this episode of The Suffering Podcast. Don't forget to go to popple.com, get your digital business card, put in the code TSP20 for a 20% discount. Follow us on all social media. That's LinkedIn, Facebook, TikTok, Instagram. Only fans. <laughs> Follow. <laughs> <laughs> follow Mike at Mike underscore Follow me at Real Kevin Donaldson. And of course, follow the Suffering Podcast. We'll see you on the next episode.